Thank you for checking out this movie review. This is for the 1981 film The House by the Cemetery by Lucio Fulci. And this review concludes my uh, entire series of doing the whole trilogy of The Gates of Hell by Lucio Fulci. So the first one was City of the Living Dead. The second one was From Beyond. And this is the third one, The House by the Cemetery. So if you want to watch all of them, I guess, then go back. They're, the other two are already on this channel by the time this one's coming out. Now, when I'm putting this out, all three of those films are available on the Shutter streaming service, so you can check them out there. That's where I did. So, let's get into this. Written and directed by Lucio Fulci, as I said. Uh, he also did Don't Torture a Duckling, Zombie, The New York Ripper, and A Cat in the Brain. I have not seen those films, but I am going to try and get to it at some point. And just so people know, I actually created a playlist on my channel for Lucio Fulci, so I will be putting all reviews related to him there. I also have one for Dario Argento at the moment, so all of his are there. I think I have like four or five at the moment. And then I also had started a playlist for Giallo, and then I'll come up with some other playlists. So if you guys have ideas on that type of stuff, what type of playlist you'd like, go ahead and put some comments down there. Uh, this film was also written by Dardano Sacchetti. He was also involved in writing City of the Living Dead and The Beyond. Um, the writing for these films is not super great just because there's not a ton of story. It's more about the actual like filmmaking, what they did on set, and the inspired scenes that they use in the kill scenes and the practical effects and the music, actually, as it goes on. Although I will say I had to... Uh, I realized that... There's like almost no story in City of the Living Dead, and then there's a little bit of story in From Beyond, uh, sorry, not From Beyond, The Beyond, and then in this one, uh, House by the Cemetery, it has the most story in my opinion. So it's just this kind of progression of like pretty much no story to actually some story in this final one, uh, although it's still kind of light on the story to be honest. It's, it's more of like a visual and gore experience, and that's, from what I understand, that's a Fulci thing. So, Dardano Sacchetti has also been involved in writing Demons, Demons 2, 1990, The Bronx Warriors, which is also available on Shudder, The Scorpion with Two Tails, A Bay of Blood, and Cat O Nine Tales, which, yes, the uh, Dario Argento film, and I will be getting to that one because that is also available on Shudder. That one's going to be reviewed at some point soon-ish. Also involved in writing was Giorgio Mariuzzo, who also helped on the script for The Beyond, and Elisa Brigante, who was involved in writing scripts for Zombie and 1990 The Bronx Warriors. So there you go. Fulci wanted to do something inspired by Lovecraft. That was his whole basis for this, but not based on one of the actual writings of Lovecraft. Now, there was a little bit of a, an, a late influence for Lovecraft that came into a City of the Living Dead, one of the main reasons, one of the main things of that being the city in that is named Dunwich, but they didn't take a whole lot actually from Lovecraft. This they supposedly took more from Lovecraft, but not from specific writings, more of like an overall feel of how he writes and how his stories are. So Sicchetti himself said the script was inspired by his childhood. Apparently he was born in a large country house with a large dark basement, and at the age of nine he actually had to cross through a cemetery in the night at one point. So that kind of, he reflected back on these moments and was like, oh, you know what? That would be good for a horror script. And those are interesting elements. They really are. That That's some of the most interesting stuff about this. The setting of this film is my favorite. The fact that it's this creepy old house, which looks very appropriately creepy, especially the basement, but all the body parts, um, and being next to the cemetery. And the fact that the kid in it, Bob, just wanders through the cemetery all the time he's not really you know his parents don't really keep good tabs on him but then again that was parenting back then kind of i mean when i was growing up you know i was running the neighborhood a lot <laughs> it was more of like a parents were just like okay uh good to see you this morning have your breakfast and uh see ya come back for lunch then go out again come back for dinner go to sleep and we'll do it all tomorrow that's kind of how this seems Fulci has talked poorly about Sacchetti in regards to this film, actually, uh, because of the script. He actually thought that the script was not that good, and he that's why he brought in Mariuzzo and Briganti to kind of make some changes. So it makes me wonder, like, how much of the script is actually Sacchetti and how much are these other individuals? And I was kind of surprised when I was reading 
that uh, Fulci was actually very outspoken about saying that Sacchetti did a poor job with the script, which, you know, you would think that people don't really want to burn bridges like that, but I guess maybe something happened between them and he didn't care about that. I don't know. So it was filmed in New York, Boston, and Concord, Massachusetts mainly. Uh, and this was actually Lucio Fulci's most profitable film from the 80s, which is interesting because I think... Uh, so of these films, I think that City of the Living Dead is my favorite of the three. Um, this one might be my second favorite. I don't know. They're all pretty close for me. Uh, I think The Beyond is actually probably my least favorite, and The House by the Cemetery is probably my second favorite. But So I guess I could maybe see why it was the most profitable, and I guess it's maybe that thing where it's like this is the end of the trilogy people have liked the first two films so they're very much anticipating the third one so that can kind of like drive interest so maybe that's why it is so well it does start with a house by a cemetery i wrote down so they get the title pretty much immediately for the film it's like here's a house here's a cemetery they make a very distinct point of that to be like it's called house by uh the house by the cemetery here's the house here's the cemetery just so you know now we've got that established let's move on then i wrote down wow that kill with the knife through the head was unexpected i mean i expected in the beginning when the woman was going in looking for her who i assume is like her boyfriend into the creepy old abandoned house that well i think they called it a mansion at one point i i was expecting she would probably get killed or he would get killed, or both of them would get killed, and they both got killed. But I wasn't expecting her to get killed in such a grandiose way. I guess I should have expected that from Fulci, because he's done a lot of that in the other films. But, like, she just gets, like, that busher knife through the back of the head, and it comes out her mouth. It kind of reminds me to The Beyond, where it was that nail through the head, the back of the head scene, where the nail comes out and, like, pokes out the eye. It's, you know, things going all the way through. And then also in City of the Living Dead where the one guy gets drilled all the way through his head. So there's kind of this connected theme through all of them about penetration through the head. Very interesting to think about. The child in the picture who warns Bob is a really cool touch to indicate that there's danger coming to the family. I really like that setup where it's the picture of that house, which they then later say, um, I think it's Lucy later says that, oh, this looks almost exactly like the picture that we have. Um, I, yeah, I just like that touch of, like, the girl being in the picture and Bob can see her, but no one else can. It's kind of this, like, connection with Bob where she's like, here's your warning, don't come here. And that kind of continues through the film. Um, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, so initially I thought that that girl was actually, like, a psychic or something. And then at the end, maybe she still is, I don't know, but it seemed more at the end that they were kind of alluding to the fact that she was a ghost. What do you guys think? Someone put a comment down there, or a few people put comments down there. What are your thoughts? Did I miss something in there where they, like, specifically said it? It kind of seemed more to me like she and her mother were ghosts in the end, and not actually, she wasn't actually, like, a psychic. They weren't real people. Um, but, yeah, um, I thought she was uh, really, really creepy when she actually introduced herself to Bob. Like, initially, you're like, oh, she wants to help. And then when Bob is, like, sitting in the car with his toy car and then she's like behind the car and she can like talk to him with her mind which then you know that further makes me think that she was a ghost like that's a really creepy moment because she's like talking kind of creepy and everything and i was just like uh well maybe she's not good i don't know um i wrote down i like the creepy house quite a bit and i also like the touch of like i was talking about before where you know lucy says oh this looks just like the house in the picture that's just a cool like eerie thing that sets up the tone of the film the talk about the mother's drugs uh they were talking about uh the the husband i forget what his name was was telling lucy that you know make sure you're taking your medication basically and she was like well some of the side effects are hallucinations i heard and i don't want to do that basically so i thought that was an interesting introduction to kind of make you question her perspective on things so that you might think oh maybe she's just um, taking her meds and she's hallucinating so the stuff isn't going on there's also a moment where I thought maybe she was the one killing people because she wasn't on her meds and she was coming unhinged because they don't specifically tell you why she has those meds so it's a it's a good moment to kind of cast doubt about a bunch of things uh, especially when it's like getting to the heart of the plot so I like that about it um 
Freudenstein, that Fre the Freudenstein person being buried inside the house, I thought that was totally crazy, totally weird, um, but kind of a cool touch in the film. But the the craziest and weirdest portion is the fact of like how the father in this reacts to it. He's just like, oh yeah, I mean, you know, whatever. It it's a thing. He like explains it as saying like this is probably something that had been done a lot in the past. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that wasn't a thing. I'm very sure that wasn't a thing. So it's just kind of a weird, you know, throughout the films in this trilogy, there are like these weird things that just happen kind of for no reason. Um, yeah, and then the fact that the father's just like, Ugh. he doesn't care. But he doesn't really care about much, to be honest. He's kind of a terrible husband and father in this. He's very much more concerned about himself. I mean, he does show up. Like, there are times where he shows up to, like, try and protect the family, but doesn't do a good job at all. <laughs> but he... um you know, he just seems very, very focused on his work. It's, like, all about his work. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, though, because that was kind of a overall theme I thought about. So anytime someone goes into a super creepy basement, I am ready for the fun to begin, and this film was no different. As soon as they go down for the first time, that's when the bat attack happens on the father, <laughs> and that bat attack was... I kind of laughed at it. It was kind of funny, much like the tarantula scene in The Beyond for me where um, it just goes on so long, and it's just so over the top, and there's so much blood, especially the fact of, like, first of all, I was surprised at, like, how long they were having it go with, like, the bat sticking on the back of his hand, like, continually biting him, and then the fact that he just, like, steadies his hand and, like, stabs the bat, and then he just, like, keeps stabbing the bat, and then he's, like, flinging his hand around, and he's just flinging blood, like, on his wife, on his kid, on the walls, just everywhere, it was such an over-the-top scene, but it was fun, and it was kind of funny, and I, I just like that. Just like I appreciate, you know, like I said, in The Beyond, the tarantula scene where they're just ripping a person apart way too much. Um, had sounded weird, though, in that one. That was a weird thing. Um, love the bad attack scene. So, uh, much like in a lot of these, the once you go into that creepy basement, fun is happening. The house looks really good, and they actually do a really great job of showcasing it from different camera angles oh, Excuse me, and moving throughout it. I thought they did an amazing job of getting really cool-looking angles and showing a lot of the inside of the house because it looks... The architecture of it looks really interesting, but it's also obviously very, very creepy, and that's kind of what they were trying to get. It looks, it looks mausoleum-ish uh, in itself, and I, I think that was probably intentional. Fulci really enjoys the slow motion blood spurting. He loves this. This is something that I've seen in, I'm not sure it was done as much. I think it was done maybe a little bit in City of the Living Dead, but he did it a good amount in The Beyond, and he did it a good amount in House by the Cemetery. Um, he just loves doing a slow motion shot of just blood like spurting out, especially of like people's upper bodies, like here and above like, that's his his favorite trauma spot for people to get it. Uh, just think about that. Interesting thing. Anne is so creepy. The uh, babysitter is crazy creepy. I mean, I assume that was a choice by Fulci to ask her to be as creepy as possible. But, you know, in the end, she wasn't like a bad guy or anything. But it kind of makes you feel like she is. Which, you know, maybe that was there as a red herring much like the whole medication thing to be like, is Anne killing people? Because a lot of the times when you see the, when you see the killing happening, it just looks like a normal hand. It doesn't look like a zombie or a demon or anything like that. Like you would assume from the final installment of the gates of hell uh, trilogy. So, and I would actually argue that this doesn't really have anything to do with a gate from hell, to be honest. Cause I don't even think they talk about or show the book of Aben in it, which I, totally assume they would unless i missed it which you know people can make a comment if that's the case because it's possible because you know i every now and then i am looking down at my phone to take notes while the movie's going uh the body parts all over the basement uh crazy that's a crazy scene like the level of detail and the amount of body parts they put there and how long that scene is and like the motion of the camera like panning over all of it awesome and then it goes over and shows like a really mangled almost whole body laying there just really gruesome and really well done and you know like i've said about these films practical effects really pretty good 
and just stood there and, and waited to be killed, by the way. When she was trying to get out of the basement and the door was locked and she's like banging on it, she just stood there and waited to be killed. She didn't try to fight back. She didn't try to run back down the stairs. She didn't try to like jump off the side. I assume like the sides of the stairway were open at some point. I think so. Because I remember when they were, yeah, when they when uh, the father was going down, when he got attacked by the bat. Yeah, there's you could have gotten out that way. So it just seemed kind of dumb that she's just like banging the whole time. It's obvious you can't get out the door. And this person's coming with a knife. And she just like takes it. She's just like, okay, I guess this is where I die. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, so either something happened to Anne or she just left your kid. So this is this is kind of my analysis of what I felt like was going on after um, Lucy came home. You know, Anne got killed. Bob's freaked out. Lucy gets home and she's trying to console him. And then it seems like she's just like, oh, well, Anne's probably somewhere else doing something or something like that. Um, so my thought on it was either something happened to Anne or she left your kid. Either of these situations is not good and not okay. So you should be concerned. Lucy should be very, very concerned. Either something actually happened to Anne, like Bob is saying, and she should be very concerned and she could look, should look into that, or... She just left the kid. She's supposed to be the babysitter, and she should be mad and concerned about that. So she should really look into both of those things. Instead, she's just like, all right, well, Bob, everything's going to be fine. I'm sure she's all good. Like, that's literally her response. And that's kind of a theme that goes on in all three of these films, mainly this one and The Beyond. Uh, there's a little bit of it in City of the Living Dead where, like, there are people who react very inappropriately to things that are going on. Like a prime example of one from the beyond that I talked about in that review was when Martha find, finds Joe dead and she's just like, huh, okay, that's a dead body. It, it's just weird. Like those things are so odd. Why would you make that choice? It, it seems very counterintuitive for the film. Like you want the terror. You want people reacting like, oh my gosh. So whatever. Uh, the glowing eyes in the basement were awesome. But it's kind of weird because once you actually see the the creature type thing in the basement, he doesn't have glowing eyes. And actually, it looks like he doesn't even have eyes. They're just like dark sockets. So where were the glowing eyes coming from? I don't know. But the glowing eyes look cool in the dark. I thought that was a cool touch. I, I liked it quite a bit. Why does the thing in the basement have a kid's voice? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I don't get it. Uh, that was kind of never explained. It was just this very random thing. It's weird. And I guess the thing, when I'm saying the thing in the basement, I guess it was supposed to be Dr. Freudstein. Was it Freudstein or Freudenstein? I think Freudstein. Um, and, yeah. I guess that was supposed to be him, but why does he have a kid's voice? It's very, very weird. It's just another one of those things that Fulci throws in that's just like, or Sacchetti throws in, that's just like, just cause, I don't know, let's just do this, I don't know, it doesn't make sense, who cares. I like the design of Dr. Freudstein in the basement, he looks really gross and deformed and weird. I like how you can't really make out much of any features on his face, so it's this kind of in-between of like, he's very much intact and very alive, but he also looks like almost partially mummified, which, you know, it just looks good. Oh, and the moment where he gets stabbed, where the father, like, stabs him in the side, and then it's just, like, oozing what actually looks like poop, like crap, and maggots just comes, like, oozing out. I was not expecting that, and I've seen a lot of stuff in horror films, as you can probably imagine, and that kind of grossed me out, to be honest. So I was like, oh, wow, uh, good job, Fulci, for kind of grossing me out, because it's not easy to do with these types of films. So I really like that. It's really nasty. Um... I like the twist of May being a Freudstein at the end, where I'm assuming it's kind of trying to reveal that she's kind of a, a ghost. Uh, I wrote down, I guess she's a ghost. I, Like I said, put some comments down there if you know for sure. And then, so the other question is, so Bob goes with her and her mother. So does that mean if May and her mother are ghosts that Bob actually died in the confrontation with Dr. Freudstein in the basement? And he's a ghost now because he's with them? Or is he still alive? I don't know. Or are they all alive? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I can't figure that out. I'm like, okay. I'm not sure it's really that important, to be honest. And then they have this quote at the end. No one will ever know if children are monsters or monsters are children. Like, the quotes seem very much like, okay. 
I mean, I guess they're going from the, the aspect of if children are terrible or if terrible people are children at heart or within their brains, like their brains aren't fully developed, so they're still developmentally children, which I guess would make sense with the thing in the basement because it has a child's voice. Or maybe is it a situation where um, May was actually trying to lure the kid in a way and get him killed. So she has some sort of control after, over Dr. Freudstein. I just don't know. This is what I'm saying. Like there's story there, but it's kind of like, is it, is it really there though? It's there and it's not there. It's just one of those things. All right. So talking about some kind of like other stuff after the events of the film, uh, much like the beyond, I think the score for this is quite good. It's not Fabio Frizi who did the beyond, but it is quite good. I forget I forget the guy's name who did that one. So my apologies, but uh, it was a good score for, for this one. Uh, the Italian rating ratings board, just so people know, asked for a six-second cut of Laura's death scene. Who's Laura? Which one was Laura? Oh, uh, Laura was the one who was getting poked. I, honestly, I would ask for a six-second cut of that just to make it move faster. You know, if, if you watch my other reviews of the Gates of Hell trilogy, you'll know that one of my biggest gripes about these films is that Fulci makes, lets things go on just way too long. And it's just like, it, you're not doing new stuff during that time. He's just showing you some of the same things. And you're just like, okay, we're good. We got the point. Let's let's keep it moving here. Uh, and then in the U, for the UK release, cuts were made to Anne and Laura's death scenes. Then an uncut version was actually released, and that got put on the Video Nasties list, just like The Beyond was also on the Video Nasties list. So, probably no big surprise there. So this film paints a picture of a father so wrapped up in his work that he ignores what's happening with his family. He barely pays them any mind, I put down. Kind of like I was saying before, the father's very, very absent. He does show up to kind of try and protect the family here and there, but... For the most part, he's so focused on trying to get to the bottom of, of his own stuff, which I guess helps a little bit in the end. But um, he, like in the, in the events of the film, like he doesn't know that, you know. So the fact that he's just so obsessed with just himself and everything is just, I think that was kind of like a thematic point there of a very disinterested husband and father. Because a lot of the times, like when anyone has concerns in the family, he's just like, oh, whatever, you know, kind of like, finding uh, the, the the grave plot, basically, for a person inside your house. He's more concerned about needing to be there for his career and for his job. He's just like, oh, well, it's fine. you know. And everything for him is like, it's fine, whatever, get over it. And then this is kind of another one of those films that's kind of like a mad scientist type film in the end because Dr. Freudstein, you find out, was trying to you know do some experiments and he needs human remains... Uh, fresh human remains in order to stay alive, basically. So it's it's that whole mad scientist thing. So, you know, there you go. Um, overall, I enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty good. Like I said, it's not my favorite. I, I still think City of the Living Dead is my favorite of the three, even though it's the one that has the least story. It's just the most visually fun, in my opinion. But I like them all. So uh, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give House by the Cemetery a three, which I believe is what I gave The Beyond, and then I think I gave a three and a half to City of the Living Dead. So they're all pretty close right there, clustered together. So uh, if you haven't seen these, definitely watch them. It's a good time. So let's talk. Everyone put some comments down there, your thoughts on this trilogy, your thoughts on Fulci in general. Love to hear it. Uh, please do me a favor and hit that subscribe, though. If you're not subscribed, if you are subscribed, hit the thumbs up, though, just to let me know you're still watching because I need motivation sometimes, people. Not like I don't like doing this, but I just need motivation. It's good for people to be like, I'm here for you, I'm watching. Otherwise, it feels like you're doing stuff for nothing. You know what I mean? But anyway, thanks, everyone, for checking this one out, and until next time, keep it brutal.